to show us yourself, that our hearts might delight in you more than life itself. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to open it to 1 Peter chapter 3. The next two weeks, we'll continue our series, Jesus With Us, from this text. So you'll get two messages from this text. So there's more to say about this text than I'll say in this sermon. Let me read for us this wonderful text. We're jumping into, into the middle of Peter's first epistle. Peter was the apostle who followed Jesus for those three years. Denied Jesus on the night he was betrayed. As an eyewitness to the, to the resurrection, was personally restored to his ministry by Jesus on that seashore in the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection. And he's writing to Christians who are persecuted for their faith in Asia Minor sometime after that. So we jump into the middle of this epistle <clears throat> and we read this, 1 Peter 3, 13 to 17. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. <clears throat> Sometimes you're reading the Bible, you come to a sentence, a text, or a phrase that's a real head-scratcher. And you go, I don't get that. Why did the writer say that? That's how I find this phrase in verse 15 where Peter exhorts us, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. You're reading along and you go, why does Peter, Peter tell that to those who are already following Jesus? In fact, if you go back to chapter 1, you read this of this group of believers in verse 8. Peter describes them this way. Though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. Though you do not now see him, but believe in him, you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. How do you get any more honoring to Jesus than that? So why does he tell his readers and us by extension, presumably who are walking with Jesus, pursuing Jesus, cherishing Jesus, why does he tell them? In your hearts, honor Christ as Lord. That's the question I want to answer this morning. And we're going to answer it in these three ways. He tells them that, number one, because Christ is the antidote to fear. Number two, because you have an incessant instinct in your heart to self-rule. And number three, because Christ is the object of our hope. Okay? Number one, why does Peter tell people who are presumably already cherishing and relishing Jesus Christ to honor him as Lord and, and holy. He's the antidote to fear. So life throws at you lots of things to fear. Losing your health, losing a loved one, losing your resources, losing your freedom, losing your very life. There's lots to fear in this life. In Peter's context, he envisions a situation where believers suffer harm because they are following Jesus. They're seeking to do good in Jesus' name. 
They're stridently striving to obey Jesus Christ in every sphere of their life. So look at verse 13. He raises a bit of a hypothetical question. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? Translated, as a rule, no matter where you live, as a rule, when you're obeying God, it is generally received favorably even by those who don't know God or follow Jesus, as a rule. But he then sort of answers his question in 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. For it is better to suffer for doing good than, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. What's Peter's counsel when life is difficult because you're following Jesus? Fight him! No. He says, if you happen to be the exception, people are expressing their disdain for you. You're being persecuted for following Jesus. Continue in righteousness. Don't cave into the temptation to do evil. It's better to suffer for righteousness than to sin. And he annexes that with a promise. You will be blessed. So anyone in the right mind sees that and they go, I do crave the favor of God upon me more than escaping the hurt that's coming because I follow Jesus. You will be blessed. Okay. So that's not all. Peter reaches back into the writing of the prophet Isaiah, and he pulls out of Isaiah 8 these words in 12 to 13, where Isaiah wrote, don't call conspiracy all this people calls conspiracy. Don't fear what they fear or be in dread, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. See where he's getting his words here in this text? Let him be your fear, let him be your dread. See, the only antidote to fear is to fear someone else. Jesus, honor, revere, respect, esteem, adore beyond everything else. So you may be wondering, how does Jesus banish fear? That's a good question. Thank you for wondering that. I'll try to answer it for you. Here's some ways Jesus banishes fear. He puts real harm in perspective. So what's the worst thing that could ever happen to a human being? Suffering eternity apart from the presence of God. That's real harm. So Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul. Kill the soul. Fear the one who has power to both cast body and soul into hell. He puts real harm in perspective. <laughs> I'd rather have Jesus and the suffering that comes with it than be without God for all eternity in unimaginable suffering. He puts real harm in perspective. Secondly, he promises to put words in our mouths. I think Angel alluded to this a couple sermons back, Luke 21, 12, when Jesus is getting his disciples ready for persecution that's coming. He says, and before all this, they'll lay their hands on you, they'll persecute you, they'll deliver you up to synagogues and prisons. You'll be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds beforehand, uh, how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and a wisdom. Don't worry about how you, I will give you a mouth and a wisdom. He, he, the antidote to fear is Jesus will put words in your mouth. He promises that. So this is your opportunity to witness. Don't fret. Uh, thirdly, how is Jesus the antidote to fear? He pours his love into our hearts. One of the apostles, John, who followed Jesus for three years, who saw love incarnate, who learned how to love by watching Jesus, into whose hearts the love of God had been poured out by the Holy Spirit. John writes this in 1 John 4, 8. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. He's thinking of Jesus. Jesus is perfect love. When the love of Jesus comes into your heart, what will it displace? Fear. He writes, fear has to do with judgment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Translated, Translated, you can endure anything if you know you're loved. No wonder David says in Psalm 63, 
your love is better than life itself. That's where I want to get to in my life. Where his love is better than life itself. Rescuing me from all the devious strategies in my heart to find love and confidence and affection apart from the only one who can give it. You can do anything if you know your love. Here, here's one other way Jesus uh, de delivers us from fear. He promises greater things than we fear losing. So take anything you'd fear losing, and what's the ultimate thing you'd fear losing? Your life. Jesus is going to restore everlasting life to you in a body that's indestructible, can't sin, can't sorrow, can't die. There's nothing you fear losing that you won't have on 10 trillion steroids in the next life. He puts it in perspective. Okay, so what, are we at, what question are we answering? Why does Peter tell you who love Jesus, you're following Jesus, you're seeking to obey Jesus and honor Jesus, why does he tell you in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy? Why? <laughs> it's the antidote to fear, the only antidote to fear. Secondly, we have an incessant instinct to, to self rule Boys and girls, incessant means nonstop. You have an incessant need for oxygen or you can't live. We have an incessant instinct to self-rule. So did you wake up this morning and say, yes, Lord, there's a defect in my heart that needs to be dealt with? Or today I will give in to this tendency, this pernicious desire to rule myself. See, so you woke, if you're at peace with God through Jesus Christ, you are correspondingly at war with sin. Peter's already alluded to this in chapter 2. When he talks about this new identity his readers have in Jesus Christ, he calls them aliens and strangers, and he says in that context 2, verse 11, I urge you to abstain from fleshly lusts which are waging war against your soul. The soul is where Christ dwells by his spirit, the new you. That's free from sin. Come to my Roman study. We're going to unpack this for months. <laughs> Sin's at war with you. You're either putting to death the deeds of the flesh or they're getting the better of you, causing all kinds of fear, anxiety, anger, out-of-control desires. You woke up at war. Sin's at war with you. So who's going to win that battle? Now, where, do, where does this come from? It actually goes back to the creation, even before sin entered, there's a principle in place that governs all of life, and the principles of this is this. For life to work, something must be killed. God gave Adam and Eve, before they sinned, a command. Don't eat of that tree. If you obey me, you'll live. Translate it. To find life as God designed it, you must mortify, you must kill, you must go to war against any inclination to disobey God. That principle, for life to work, something must be killed, is certainly enforced now that sin is in the world. For your life to work, you've got to be daily killing sin and all its desires within you. Again, we'll unpack that for months in Romans 5 to 8. So no wonder the wisest man in the world, Solomon, wrote in Proverbs 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart versus trust in what? Yourself. Because this is the next thing out of his mouth. Don't lean on your own understanding. You know why he tells you that? Because of this pernicious tendency to incessantly trust yourself. You have that in you. And self-trust never gets you to the glory of God. It never helps you. It might feel like it at the moment, but that's a lie. He says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That should be good enough for us if we're in our right minds. <laughs> but he's not done. Verse 7, be not wise in your own eyes. Why does he tell you that? Because there's a persistent, incessant tendency in you for self-rule to be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Some of you are saying, but Mike, I'm religious, I go to church. That's wonderful.
but make sure your religion isn't fraught with taking God on your own terms. Right? Do you know that's a tendency in your heart and mind? We want God. <laughs> we kind of want him on our terms. We want enough of Jesus, but just enough so that we have the benefits of Jesus, but we're still in control of our lives. Do you know that's in you? Kill it. Seriously. Or it's killing you. And any desire to savor Jesus, your life. For example, when I read in my daily reading, Psalms, Proverbs, Old Testament, Gospels, New Testament, somewhere else, I read in Psalm 86, 11, Psalm of David. He says, unite my heart to fear your name. Oh, that's it. I look at my heart and it's not united, it's duplicitous. One famous theologian said, your heart is a veritable factory manufacturing idols. Not so famous theologian, John Calvin said that. Your heart's a factory manufacturing idol. You unite my heart to fear your name. Half of my heart wants to honor Jesus. The other half wants to honor, you can say it, Mike. <laughs> I need a whole heart that wants to honor Jesus. So I've got to do some praying, some reading, some killing sin in that moment. So this explains to you why in the Gospels, Jesus says, no one can have two what? Two masters, right? Unite my heart. Master Jesus, Master Mike. You can't live that way. No one can have two masters. And on the heels of that, Jesus says, if anyone would follow me, he must take up his cross daily and follow me. So guess what? If, you're, if you have two masters in your heart, one of them must be killed. You. <laughs> this is the ongoing work of your life. Sanctification. We do it with a smile. Grieving over our sin, but under the affectionate gaze of our God who loves us, who enters into our brokenness, who does not hold it against us, who wants to fight with us for our sin even more than we do. But let's not stop there. Let's get underneath this incessant instinct to self-rule. What's it really all about? That's just a manif that's just a fruit, that's just a manif manifestation of something else. What is this self-rule thing all about? You know what's at the heart of it? Unbelief. I don't believe Jesus is better ruling my life than I am. I don't believe my life will experience the kind of goodness that I envision if Jesus is Lord. That's called unbelief. That's insane, isn't it? It's insane. Because Jesus has proven he has your best interests in mind. But look, what motive, here's what I'm saying. What motivates you to take your life into your own hands is you don't believe Jesus has your best interests in mind. And this is why Peter has gone to the lanes he has in this epistle to show you, oh, yes, he does have your best interests in mind. Chapter 1, verse 18, he has redeemed you with his own precious blood. That's having your best interests in mind. Chapter 2, he bore your sin in his body on the cross. That's having your best interest in mind. And the verse that follows the one we just read this morning, chapter 3, verse 18, it was your assurance of uh, pardon this morning. He suffered once for sins for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. <laughs> there is someone in this universe who can make you safe and whole and perfect for the presence of God, Jesus. He did so by suffering unjustly. He has your best interest in mind. The, it's only the gospel that has the power to overcome this insidious unbelief in my heart. Last reason. We're answering the question, why does the scripture tell you who follow Jesus and love Jesus 
to in your heart honor Christ the Lord as holy. Third reason, Christ is the object of our hope. Now you notice in the verse that Peter anticipates a situation where somebody sees your life and they ask you, uh, Peter tells you, always be ready to make a defense and apologia to anyone who asks you for the reason that is hope, for the reason of the hope within you. I'm gonna talk more about that aspect of this text next week. But why does Peter tell his readers, be ready to talk about your hope? Because this is one of the great divides between followers of Jesus and the Gentiles, followers of Jesus and those who don't. We have a hope. They don't. We have a confident expectation that the best is yet to come. That's not what our unbelieving friends in the world have. This is why Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians 4, we grieve the death of a loved one. We grieve, but not as those who have no hope. You ever been to a funeral of somebody who had no hope? Oh, they're just hopeless. No, we have hope. I played pickup basketball with this gentleman uh, years ago at the University of Virginia. He was not a follower of Jesus. He told me the story one time that he had accompanied his wife to a trip to Russia. She was on business there and he went along and he found a pickup basketball game with some native Russians. He said as it, as it was nearing, sorry, as it was nearing, they stopped and they surrounded him and they just stared at him. I said, what was going on? He said, they could tell I had hope. What do you mean? I knew I was leaving there for a much better place to go home to America. I said, how could you tell? He said, they saw it in my eyes. People can see in your eyes. You have hope for a much better place, a much more glorious life. And again, this is a big divide between what believers, followers of Jesus are privileged to have and those who don't. There's a version of hope in our culture, and it goes like this. We have hope in the future because together we can make the world a better place. We believe in the triumph of the human spirit. Each of us has the potential within to be a better person and when we do our best and trust ourselves, we have hope for a brighter tomorrow. I don't blame anyone for wanting that, desiring that, or feeling that way. I don't blame anyone for that. The challenge is, whose vision of tomorrow are we talking about? <laughs> that's, a, that's about a five-hour discussion over coffee. And secondly, this has just never happened in the history of the world. We continue to kill each other and have conflict and have wars. This just hasn't happened. So biblical hope, what is it? You know, the word is used 50 times in the New Testament. You could actually say that the New Testament as a document is a document about hope. So when you talk to your neighbors and your friends and, and, and they, you get to the subject of hope, maybe say, hey, I have a book in which this word hope is used 50 times. Maybe we can read it together. So what is the biblical notion of hope? It means confident certainty. It's not, Eagles are playing today, I hope they win like I have no control over that. It's confident expectation. That's hope. In this epistle, it is virtually synonymous with faith. So if you go back to chapter 1, verse 3, Peter again begins by saying, you have been born again to a living hope, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it turns out our hope is alive because Christ is our hope and Christ is in us by the Holy Spirit. 
Our hope is a confidence in a glorious future because Christ is our future and Christ is risen from the dead. He is the hope of glory. Are you familiar with Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 15 when he goes, if we're, and this is the defense of the resurrection, if we're the only people who hope in this life and no resurrection, we're a bunch of pitiful people. That was sort of the Mike translation of it. What does this do for you in tragedy? You should be wondering, and that's very fair to wonder. What does this living hope do for you in tragedy? Let me illustrate it. 1996, some of you may remember the flight of TWA 800. It, it went in the ocean right off of Long Island after takeoff. There was a young man on that flight named Matthew Alexander. He was 20 years old. He was headed to France to, to do a missions trip. Why? Because of the hope within him, he wanted people in France to have that hope. He perished in that crash. Turns out his father was a PCA pastor in Florence, South Carolina. World Magazine, World Magazine interviewed his dad about coping with this tragedy. Here's what his father wrote. For some, there's hopelessness and despair, a cynicism about life. You can understand that. Others are getting angry and bitter, wanting to fight, find somebody to blame it on. The big thing yesterday was passing out angel pins to put on your shirt to give you guidance. I told my children, if somebody asks you if you wanted an angel pin to guide them, just tell them you have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we had a wonderful time worshiping with other Christians. This is right after the crash. It was wonderful to get away from the secular psychologist talking about grief and death. On the beach nearest the plane's resting place, Mr. Alexander asked a New York pastor to read from Romans 8 from Matthew's Bible. They found it next to his body at the bottom of the ocean. So I guess on takeoff, he's reading his Bible. Next to his body at the bottom of the ocean. So they read from Romans 8. At the heart of it, Pastor Alexander says, it's just the grace of Christ that gets us through it. He's there. He's sufficient. We gave Matthew to God as an infant through baptism. Now we've given him back to God. He was God's to begin with. God just took what was already his. That's a living hope. That's a lot of faith. And it forces me to ask this question. If my hope isn't very strong, bright, or vivid. It must be that the sight of my hope, the object of my hope, is dim or small. Right? Not feeling very hopeful? I must have a very small Christ. So the principle here, beloved, is this. What controls you is what's most real to you. What controls you is most, what's most real to you. So you're out driving, you go by a terrible accident. Ambulances, cars are wrecked, you know, people on stretchers, blood everywhere. And what do you do for the next few miles? You drive very carefully because it's very vivid. It's controlling you. So about 10 miles down the road, what? You're back to your normal driving. You know, the, you know what this is like. <laughs> so the principle is what captures the imagination captures the life. Because what captures the imagination rules the heart, and what rules the heart rules the life. Beloved, hope is a person. It's Jesus. He is the glory of God. He is true beauty. It is in his presence, Psalm 16 says, there is fullness of joy, and his right hand pleasures forever. Faint sight of Jesus produces Listless hope, clear sight of Jesus, our hope, produces a living hope. So this is the end here. So Peter writes, in your hearts, this is the seed of your whole being, in your hearts, honor, esteem, adore Christ the Lord as holy. It's, 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 again, it's one of those head scratchers. But as holy means set apart. It's really his call to say, is Christ the Lord, your Lord? So if there's any doubt in your mind, let me do an 
a, 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 a broad sweep over the Bible and tell you in an instant how it describes Christ the Lord. Because your Bible tells you that Christ is the Lord of all. The Lord of all creation. The Lord of glory. The sovereign Lord of history. He is Lord of lords. He is Lord of life. He is Lord of the living. The Lord of all power. The Lord of grace. The Lord our peace. The Lord of salvation. The Lord of the lost. The Lord of the nations. The Lord of his church. Jesus is the Lord of truth. He's the Lord of wisdom. He's the Lord of judgment. And best of all, he's your Lord. I think that's Peter's point. He's your Lord. And because he is this Lord that I just described, and I haven't begun to describe him, that means, beloved, that Jesus Christ is the person deserving your most. Jesus is worthy to receive your most, your most admiration, your most love, your most adoration, the one you most want to please, the one you most want to imitate, the one you most want to follow, the one you most want to make a difference for, the one you most want to consult when you're making a decision, the one you most need more than anything, the, mo the one you most depend on more than anything, the one you most have as him who's better than life itself. What an invitation to look to Christ and be satisfied and worship. Let's pray. We do together this morning, Lord Jesus Christ, in our hearts adore you Lord of lords, King of kings, God of our salvation, shepherd of our souls, the risen Lord of life, the forgiver of our sins, the one we must most, oh, move our hearts that way for your glory. In your name we pray, amen. Beloved, we 